But there is a lot of my wife, she's not, she's not the, the only new one, because uh, Sylvie, the sit here, she is also working for a PhD principle. Is, uh, she has a contract with the Evo Work Group, so she means that is uh, from the Unidad Social, but uh, she's working with uh, Luciano and me here, and she's sitting, the, sitting in the student room here in the room. Okay. okay, so now we'll talk. Uh, typically, it's kind of uh, a spin off of the robust conference we had. <laughs> <laughs> so, at least he, his plane was not cancelled. <laughs> uh, we have, of course, so Alex and Nina, so somewhere there, and the uh, uh, colleagues, of course, all right. So, the only event conference at the conference. But I think we managed to convince him to give a talk on. And I'm with the topic to what to explain at the robust conference. We're planning to hold this conference again in autumn, September, October the 12th, around the West. <laughs> and then he will be he will give another talk there on a, on a different topic. Okay, he comes for it, he studied at the at the sorry no, he did his PhD at the, the Munet University with Neymar Rubia, although he did a co-op he he's he was been Half of his time in the University of California, San Diego, with Catherine. So after the, the thesis, he went to the Oxford University, to the mathematics, mathematics department in Oxford, in Oxford University. Uh, he's been there two years, and then he's back in Spain with a panda of here by the Ethics Newly Creative Institute of the ICMAT. Uh, he's a member of the thesis, you know, he's different, different logos. Um, he's Current interests are broadly on statistical mechanics, non equilibrium statistical mechanics, growth processes, some obligations in biology and chemistry. And since he's in the mathematics department, he also feels obliged to do some mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> working on the study of analytic of asymptotic solutions of uh, the pressure equations. So, this is going to tell about this paper, who was, recent, was published recently in the Penance. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Raul for his invitation to the workshop that unfortunately... Because of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I want to thank Raul for the invitation to the workshop that unfortunately uh, could not take place, but uh, anyway, it's for me a pleasure being here and giving the seminar. And I also want to thank uh, uh, the fish. This is all of you for your hospitality. I will uh, mainly talk about this problem about uh, Swarm's self-organization, but uh, if I have time, I will briefly mention a couple of uh, problems concerning fluctuations at the end. So I will start describing some basic uh, properties of locus. Uh, first, first of all, I'm sure you know that locusts are a very serious problem in many parts of the of the world. Some figures are here. They they can invade over 20% of the Earth's land, and also they, they can influence uh, for bad the life of the 10% of the people on the planet. And uh, the largest uh, swarms comprise billions of individuals. They cover hundreds of square uh, kilometers and they can travel up to uh, 330 kilometers uh, per day and these, uh, <coughs> these guys can eat uh, their own weight uh, every day so this is why they constitute a serious problem for many developing regions in the world for which uh, agriculture is important so how many kilos is a, is a swarm? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are really devastating. Mm -hmm. And I will mention now some features about the biology of locusts. But I should say that I'm a physicist, not a biologist, so I might become I may become imprecise in some in some points. Where locusts can be found in nature in two phases the gregarious phase and uh, the solitary phase. In the gregarious phase, they like other locusts and they try to meet. And uh, this allows uh, the formation of swarms. In the solitary phase, which is uh, <coughs> the most usual, they dislike different locusts, so swarms are not possible. 
there is of course this uh, change in behavior but also young locust uh, change their appearance even the, the color for young locust is different in the gregarious phase and the solitary phase now the natural question is of course how can locusts change from one phase to the other uh, they change phase uh, by touch and by touch I mean physical touch there is no uh, interaction, no uh, exchange of chemicals, pheromones, whatever. This was uh, shown with an experiment in which the body of a locus was touched by uh, plastic balls and this induced the shift of phase. But it depends where you touch the locus, <coughs> this change is induced or not. The most sensible part in the body of the insect is the uh, upper part of the leg. By hitting the locus here, you, you may uh, change its phase from the solitary one to the gregarious one. Uh, also, the smell and sight uh, are not actually so important. If one locus sees other locus, or smells other locus, or, I mean, uh, as was shown uh, in a different experiment, there is almost no change of phase. However, if they act together, you find that there is a, a measurable uh, phase change here, but touch on its own is able to be, uh, it's much more efficient than uh, smell and sight acting at the same time. And uh, this explains uh, how the uh, locust became gregarious and like each other, form swarms, but uh, why? <coughs> Swarms appear in the field, and why they they move? Because sorry, there's no. If you touch it once, it changes from one phase to the other. No, then no, you no, touch it again, it changes. Back or, to, or stays in one phase. You have but, to repeatedly. You have to repeatedly hit the leg. Okay. The okay. Locust. So, uh, for instance, uh, a storm may change the face of a locust. The raindrops hitting on the legs may change the face. But it should be some repeat. Okay. And how long is the, the lifetime of the phase more? Uh, once the phase is changed, yeah, if you uh, keep the locus isolated, it will be back to the solitary phase after a uh, couple of days probably. Uh -huh. But I'm not sure about this, but I think it will work out. And, uh, well, um, how you can explain then that uh, swarms are formed in the field? This uh, was also done uh, with an experiment by, oh, sorry, based on the on this uh, phenomenology. The basic <coughs> idea is that uh, when you have a lot of resources, when you have a lot of brain, a lot of food, the number of locus increases. Then if somehow the food is reduced, a locus try to go to the few places where they find food, the uh, density increases, they touch each other, and the fish changes, they form a swarm. And this and the what does this swarm? Exactly. Swarm. Swarm is in hundred. It's the uh, the collection of all locus. If you have uh, the, the locus dispersed, uh, also the density might increase, you don't have a real uh, change of phase. But uh, if you have uh, co uh, the food concentrated, so locus uh, come more and more together, then this, uh, this sharp change from the uh, solitary phase to the gregarious phase. So this is, this is how it explains the phenomenology what, what's found in the field. Uh, food starts disappearing and locus, uh, they come together for the remaining food, they touch each other <coughs> and change phase, a swarm is formed. Just let me uh, say that in this case, the word phase has nothing to do with uh, phase transition in physics. This is the phase, is the, the word Biologists employ for distinguishing between, between locusts, but this is why I'm using this word. It has nothing to do with 
phase transition, phase transitions in physics. And why why do they move? Okay, these are moving because they don't have much food. So somehow this is implicit in the behavior of the gregarious locus. They uh, try to look for food, so they start walking. But also because they are cannibals. And this was also found, found in the field, in this picture. And uh, apparently, one of the reasons for the movement is that they try to, uh, to go, to escape from the locus behind, and to follow the, the locus in front of them. So this generates the, the movement of the swarm. And there are few reasons why a standing locus is interesting. Uh, from a biological point of view, it's fundamental understanding why uh, and how the swarming, uh, the non-swarming form changes to the swarming form. Also, of course, from an applied viewpoint, one is interested in, in controlling uh, the pests of locusts. <coughs> and from a new science viewpoint, one has the well, one may use the the nervous system of locusts as a model for uh, social behavior in insects. But also from a statistical mechanics viewpoint, it's interesting studying locus art, as I will show in the following. And I will concentrate on one uh, precise experiment with locus. Uh, locus, uh, young locus, which are wingless, so they cannot fly, they march, were placed on a plastic ring. Uh, completely isolated <coughs> from the rest of the world. And uh, the numbers range oh, sorry, from 5 to uh, 120, which means densities from about 12 to 300 locus square meter. And the maximum duration was 8 hours because of the because the locus were totally isolated, so no food was introduced here, and after, after eight hours walking, they were completely exhausted, so the, this, this, put, uh, this put a natural end to the experiment. <laughs> but I don't understand that they, they can jump, they jump outside the air ring. No, 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 they are totally isolated. But they can run. No, uh, this ring has, wall, has walls, exactly, yeah. yeah. Also from the top. From, also from the Pardon? Also from the top. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a box. Oh, yeah, it's a box. And uh, for high numbers of locus, they observe this collective movement that I will show them. Oh, sorry. Oh, this is this is the So you may see that the you can see that most of the locus uh, walk together in uh, this convective motion. <laughs> Although you can find uh, some strange guys <laughs> running in the opposite side, and few of them that were stopped, but most of them were uh, doing this collective motion. So, uh, but who jump? I don't see them. I don't see them jumping. No, no, they are jump locus, so they don't have flights. Apparently, they only can march. So, a special kind of locus. Jump. Yeah. In this particular experiment, uh, as far as I know, they didn't uh, appreciate any uh, strong effects due to uh, cannibalization. So if that happened, it was very rare, very isolated. Okay, and these are the results. In terms of uh, mean velocity, this is the uh, well uh, alignment, but this is uh, up to normalization, the same of as average velocity. For a small number of a small numbers of locus, this is uh, six, seven locus define a complete uh, disorder, uh, a stochastic evolution of the mean velocity. But for uh, well, for large number of locus, which is the, the example we have seen. After a short transient, they reach an ordered state and they walk coherently 
for the for the whole duration of experiment. For intermediate densities, this means 20 to 30 locus, you find that uh, some uh, uh, for, for some periods the locus uh, worked together, but uh, suddenly a shift of direction appears, <coughs> and all together they change the direction of motion and continue for the range of one two hours working in the same direction and the same for the whole duration of the experiment. If you look at the uh, trajectories for the individual locus, what you see is uh, totally random trajectories for small numbers of locus. Uh, what, are, what are you plotting here? Pardon? What are you plotting in the X? <laughs> in D. In D. Here. No, D. 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 Uh, here. These are the trajectories. Position in degrees. Position in degrees. Position in degrees. This is yeah, this time and this is degrees. So the movement is random. But for intermediate densities, you see that uh, order starts to appear, and for high densities, you uh, see a, a, well, the, the coherence in the motion is apparent, although you may also see these uh, trajectories of locus that are stopped, but they are uh, evidently the minority of them. The movie was real time, was it? Yeah, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's, it is. And uh, to explain this phenomenology, in this same article, they adapted a model introduced by Vixek and collaborators. And the model uh, looks like this. You have that the <coughs> position of the individual of the high uh, locus is uh, actualized with the velocity, and the velocity obeys a nonlinear uh, stochastic differential equation. Uh, we have a drift term and a stochastic <coughs> term, which is additive and uh, takes into account the errors that the locus make when trying to adapt their velocity to that of their neighbors. The uh, drift, uh, well, in the drift here we have a g, which is a piecewise linear function of the mean velocity. This quantity is the average of the uh, velocity of all the locus that lie within a certain radius epsilon of locus r. here with one picture. We have locus, locus i here. Huh? <coughs> and certain radius epsilon. So This quantity here is the average of all the velocities of locus lying uh, inside this cycle. But locus outside does not contribute to the to the g function. I have a stupid question. Very stupid. Why don't you just write this as x dot equals to v, v dot equals to something? Why why is there need to write the model as something which is already discrete? No, you, it's the same. You can write it in a continuous fashion. Yeah, but, but more natural, right? X dot in, here you introduce a new parameter, which is delta t, which is it's a fake parameter, so no, it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's totally correct, yes. This is, uh, when you solve this numerically, you have to express yeah. it somehow. But, but you have to make sure that things do not depend on delta t. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's not why, why. It's, it's, a, it's a fashion, it's not just you. <coughs> what a fashion of writing everything in the description. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, that's right, that's right. I think that the actual model is just uh, good to be. This is a derivative, it's fine. Uh, so the Carlos, what is the meaning of the radius epsilon if the locus is only interact by contact? Uh, contact is, uh, is what triggers the <coughs> shift of phase, yes. But it's not clear what is uh, aligning locus. So uh, it's uh, very difficult to explain all the features of locus run in desert because there are many, many reasons. There are, you have to explain uh, this phase change, you have to explain why they move, but also why, why they are aligned. So this, this is in principle a totally different mechanism. We cannot say that uh, touch drives alignment. Touch drives uh, this change of phase, but alignment, as far as uh, well, the things we have seen so far, we, we still have no clue about alignment. This is the experiment was uh, devoted to.
to, to try to understand this. this well, problem. I guess if, if you see the, your neighbors walking in one direction, you follow them, most probably. This you have only two directions of, of movement, this or this one, because the reversal is very short. Exactly, yeah. This, this is very reasonable, and it was, uh, I think it was the idea underlying the also. Underlying the... Your statement, your statement, Claudio, is very complicated. You say that they, uh, the most probable thing is that if you see, then you follow, so are those things, they, they have a reason, they observe, they try to... You don't need to reason anything, it's just follow. What do they say? Birds, birds do the same. But that's not the point. That's not the answer. That's that's, oh, a, that's a different question, how universal is the behavior, but I, I mean, you well, can't that the seemed to me... But the original model was for birds, was not for birds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so this is this uh, mean velocity, and we have this uh, g function. I will plot the drift, so it will come uh, the deterministic part of the... Dynamics will become clearer. Okay, this is a grid. So one finds two stable fixed points here, and one unstable fixed point, which is a region. Uh, you find that the drift. It's a piecewise linear with a discontinuous at the, uh, discontinuity at the origin because the function g is chosen to be discontinuous. But uh, basically, the deterministic dynamic says that <coughs> uh, locus try to adjust the velocity to uh, that of their neighbors and uh, to go either to plus one or minus one velocity for, uh, of course, a normalized <coughs> velocity. They, uh, they solved this model numerically and they found, uh, adjusting the, of course, the parameters, that for uh, a small number of locus, similar to those in the experiment, the mean velocity is totally random for large numbers of, of locus or self propelled particles. You find order and continuous motion, and for uh, intermediate numbers, you find that this coherence in the movement is uh, uh, you find in the middle of, of them these uh, shifts of direction so in some sense this may uh, explain or, or at least this uh, reminds of the behavior of the phenomenology of the experiment and a uh, few more comparisons that uh, they did in this in this paper the mean velocity in the experiment for uh, a small number of locus were kind of random and then they went to uh, either plus one or minus one and in the model you find this kind of uh, bifurcation if you allow the term also the time spent in the order phase increases uh, monotonically uh, with the number of locus both in uh, experiment and model and uh, the, the time spent walking continually in one dimension uh, sorry, the number of shifts of direction decreases monotonically both in experiment and model so uh, somehow this model still captures some of the features of the experiment uh, we wanted to go a step further and we applied the uh, equation free analysis, which is uh, a technique which was uh, developed by uh, Professor Janis Kevrekidis, and the technique uh, goes basically like this. One assumes that there is some, um, I'm sorry for the <laughs> formulation, that should be DU. Uh, one assumes that there is a Langevin equation which is able to give a reasonable descri description of the mean velocity EU. But we don't know drift and diffusion terms. They are unknown, but we can uh, estimate them 
in the case of a model from a simulation, using uh, these simple formulas. So we tried these techniques with this with this problem. So the first group is the mean, is the, the collective, the mean, the mean velocity. So mean, mean velocity. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, this is an assumption. So we started with the simplest case, which is assuming that this epsilon was equal to L, which is the system size. This is a mean field assumption, of course. Everything is connected. The average here uh, over time, <coughs> what, are the, what the average is here to stand for? Uh, this average is uh, in realizations. Yeah, but you always see, but you are going to take the data from a real experiment and you only have one realization. Uh, well, no, we, we have a few of them, but not so many. But in this case, you can uh, well, you, you can assume ergodicity and rate of release for long run uh, for long time. Uh, yeah. So then, uh, then if you run over one time, means that f of u does not change in time. Uh, pardon? That if you average over time, that yeah. means that the the, the, the the deterministic term is constant in time. Uh, if the they are that you are going to obtain. If they are working continuously, that's true. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not talking about what they do. I'm talking about the methodology. Uh -huh. I mean, if the methodology is applied yes. uh, in such a way that to uh, compute f of u, you average on time, yeah. the f of u that you obtain is constant in time. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, yes. So you will never, for example, obtain an f of u which is just proportional to u if u changes in time. You will obtain something that is constant. Uh, so how do you determine that? Okay, let's... let's Let's keep explaining the, the plots and probably this will be. Yeah. Look, this is. Uh, he we don't have this this problem because this is uh, with. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, with this is applied to the to the model. So actually, you can in, uh, initialize the model as many times as you wish. So you can you can average the orientations. Uh, so. We start with the assumption that epsilon uh, is equal to L, so this is a mean field approximation, and you can solve uh, this model exactly. So you can compare the result of the equation-free analysis with the uh, exact solution, and uh, the exact solution is this uh, blue line for the effective potential. You find here that uh, at the region there is a cast. This is. Uh, this is non differentiable and this comes, of course, from the discontinuity of the drift. And uh, one finds very good, uh, very good agreement with the equation free computed potential even at the cast. Of course, one finds again uh, a good agreement with the stochastic probability distribution and uh, switches are explained in terms of uh, jumps from one potential from one wall of the potential to the other. So the mean switching time is the mean passage time in the double wall potential. Computing this mean switching time uh, analytically, the blue line, and um, numerically with this method, one finds again a very good agreement. Well, let me just say, how about the question by pair? How do you find this as a question of uh, <coughs> this, uh, this F you mean? It, yes, uh, you, you, you compute the average and mm -hmm. you get a number f. Yep. What, are the, what are the u? Yeah, initializing the system in many different states. Okay, that's, what you're <coughs> that's, that's how you do it. And uh, the next step is analyzing the model in a different regime, say epsilon is much smaller than l, which is the local interaction and uh, results are noisier but again one finds uh, this uh, average <coughs> or, or this effective diffusion is roughly constant and the drift is, uh, is a cubic so we had at the beginning this piecewise discontinuous drift now we have Something which is uh, well reflects the same uh, the same sort of dynamics, but is somehow uh, regularized by the local interaction. 
which is here. And one may uh, compute the uh, stationary probability distribution from the uh, from this technique, this equation free technique, which is the red curve. And uh, the blue histograms are simulations of the model, and there is a reasonable agreement. And also the mean switching time from the <coughs> direct uh, simulations of the model and from the uh, from the equation free analysis, there is a uh, a reasonable agreement again, and we find that the, the mean switching time, as expected, grows exponentially with the number uh, of locus n. So the last step is using this technique uh, in the model, in the with the actual data uh, taken from the experiment, and uh, see what happened. In this case, the drift is again a uh, cubic. Uh, which is uh, again we have something which is noisier, much noisier, but somehow this uh, this plot reflects the the same character as the as the one found in the in the model. However, the diffusion is quite different, and it, it somehow resembles a, a parabola, some quadratic function rather than a constant. <laughs> if one uh, uh, plots the average potential, one finds something like a double world potential, which is uh, what we what we were uh, expecting for the uh, from the from this kind of models. And finally, the mean switching time in uh, this course are experimental data, and the, this is the equation for the mean switching time. So a uh, reasonable agreement again with. Again, we find this uh, exponential growth of the switching time with the number of locus. Yes, so, sorry, Carlos. I think in the, in the experimental curves, mm -hmm. it was the, the axis, the rotating axis was exactly the other, in the other axis. Okay. Uh, you, if, well, if you can, if not, we can discuss something here, but I think in the experimental, in the different science, the, the, the growth of the switching time was logarithmic in the no uh, well, I don't remember the figure yeah, since it in your presentation. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not really well. I mean, it's the horizontal, the n is the logarithmic scale. n? Yeah. This, well, it's not a perfect mm -hmm. line, but then it's, it's n is logarithmic and the, and the changes is. And also, I don't. Uh, no, no, no number of changes. This is the opposite of the scale you are using. Uh, right. It's, it's, it's number of changes, not time. Sorry? It's number of changes. So it's the number of time. You have a time in the other world. Anyway, we can't have a look at the other world. It doesn't seem to be the same curve as, as we are showing. No, no. Uh, it's not necessarily the same. So, uh, I don't know which I'm not an uh, author of this figure, so I, I don't know uh, which data we use for this figure. We are using, using from the experiment, you say? We, we use the same, we should use the same data. Right? But uh, we started from scratch. So we, we didn't use the data of this particular figure. So I, I'm not sure about the, uh, the result here. But you find uh, all the, uh, one can expect that the results were uh, very noisy. But uh, from our results, it's quite clear that uh, this is an exponential growth with number of locus of the mean in time. So, does the method allow you to, to get the excellent reasons or the or something, some information about? Mm, no, because we only get this, uh, we only get the. Uh, Effective uh, Langevin equation. Yeah. So we, we lose the yeah, coarse grain technique. Mm -hmm. We lose that about the microscopic interactions. And, and if you're here, can, can you if you show me the same slide? So, the blue. so what is the red and what is the blue then? Here, the blue is the exact solution of the system. Yeah. Uh, if you do a mean field approximation, which means epsilon <coughs> equals. <coughs> Hmm? And what is the, red? the red is what you get uh, simulating this system 
and using the equation free technique. So in mean field there is a very good agreement. And any uh, anywhere you find not a quantitative agreement but a qualitative agreement with mean field. So uh, once we have seen uh, uh, this, we have proposed to uh, modify the to modify the Bixic model. And well, because the drift uh, agrees reasonably, we left everything unchanged but the noise. And instead of using an additive noise, we use a multiplicative noise, which is a quadratic function. In this case, we use the uh, mean velocity in this uh, within this uh, circle of radius epsilon. And Physically, this means that uh, locus they are not only trying to adjust the velocity to that of their neighbors, but also uh, their stochasticity. So, if they are aligned, uh, the noise is reduced. The randomness in the movement is reduced, and where they are unaligned, the randomness of the movement increases of the individual locus. If one analyzes the well runs the uh, simulations for this uh, modified model, one finds that for the diffusion, uh, the effective diffusion, one again finds this uh, parabolic uh, profile and the cubic uh, for the 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 cubic for the drift and. Uh, the, uh, ex uh, the exponential dependence of mean switching time with uh, number of locus that uh, showed actually a reasonable agreement with uh, with experiment. This is the experiment. <coughs> this light blue one and the the blue dark blue squares are the mean switching the uh, equation free mean switching time. This is a linear match. And uh, apart from this comparison with the diffusion, one also may uh, take a look uh, at the uh, realizations of the process. <coughs> so this is the average velocity of uh, uh, realization of the simulation of the big set model. And in this case, we have, uh, we have the, the real data and in the, uh, finally, this is the realization of the average velocity of the improved or reduced uh, model. For the original, uh, for the original basic model, the switches are uh, not uh, much uh, noisy. They are quite straight. How many locus are you using here? Uh, in this case, uh, this is from the. Well, the uh, actual locus is in this case, which if I remember well, this is uh, for 25 locus. But uh, in this case, we use the same number, of course, but you have a parameter you can adjust. Yes. Uh, in, in this case, this actual data, you find that the switches are not straight but very noisy. And again, uh, for the revised model, you find that the switches are noisy again. And of course, this, this is uh, very clear from this dependence of the, uh, of the multiplicative noise when the uh, when they are uh, the locus are uh, unaligned this is in the neighborhood of zero uh, average velocity the noise increases so this is why the paths uh, become noisier in this case and well, by visual inspection one finds more agreement in uh, uh, in uh, for the risk model when compared to the actual experimental data and uh, just uh, let me say that movement in groups uh, it's it's good for for the animals it's, uh, uh, it, it is quite clear in biology that collective movement is favorable uh, favorable from a evolutionary viewpoint uh, this mechanism helps the group uh, stay aligned. For the same uh, amount of noise, that if we use this additive noise, we will find that the coherent, uh, the aligned state 
will, uh, will last longer, the number of switches is reduced, and uh, if we uh, find the system in a disordered in a disordered state, it will reach the ordered state faster. So uh, this mechanism is uh, apparently good for the for the collective uh, movement and consequently for the insects. If one want to uh, uh, give some more uh, some deeper explanation of this phenomena uh, in terms of uh, evolutionary dynamics, for instance, the first thing uh, would be moving to the real uh, field experiments uh, to, to the phenomena and seeing how this uh, is modified or if this persists in the in the real case. I will uh, conclude this part of the talk, which is a uh, very brief conclusions. First one is the mean switching time increases uh, exponentially with the number of, of locus of self-propelled uh, self-propelled particles in the model. And uh, this uh, multiplicative term uh, is uh, favors the alignment of the group. So uh, it seems that uh, actual actual locus, when they are unaligned, they increase the randomness of the of the motion, and it, this helps. This facilitates that the orbital state is reached faster and will uh, will last longer. More details are oops, in this in uh, in this reference. I would like, of course, to thank uh, my collaborators in this in this work, uh, Jerome <coughs> Bull from the University of Sydney, uh, Ian Cassin from uh, uh, Princeton, Rally Kerban from Oxford, Janis Kyrakidis, uh, who is the developer of this equation-free technique from Princeton, Philip Manny from Oxford, um, uh, David Sampa <laughs> from Uppsala, and um, Christian Yates uh, from Oxford. Um, because you have uh, some time left. Oh, Before you jump into the team, um, I don't know if you said that, but have you tried to measure the time distribution between uh, two uh, between a regime with positive velocity and another one with positive velocity? I mean, the time distribution will be an exponential? I mean, how okay. uh, in the process? In the case of the model, it is possible. In the case of the real locus, it's difficult to say because we have uh, very limited data. So, well, I didn't mention that this experiment was run and when we started this uh, this project, the the laboratory actually didn't, didn't exist. They moved it to from UK to Australia, and uh, and they didn't continue with the same experiment. So we use already existing data, and with this data, it's very difficult to say that this for some, but it's uh, it's a reasonable possibility. But in the models, it is for some. Yes. Before you go to a different one, may also ask something to the validity range of, of mm -hmm. your model. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether it will play a role here, but uh, from, from traffic modeling, you know that also if you increase a certain density, you get kind of compression waves, which can even lead to a stop uh, of, uh, of moving uh, in a certain direction. Does that uh, occur in, in the experiments here as well? And would that, uh, for example, break uh, this this exponential dependence that, that you find with the with the switching times. Well, uh, what we observed in the experiments is that the locus are kind of even distributed in the ring. So these uh, shocks or something like this are not observed. Mm -hmm. This uh, I don't know if this can be reasonably explained in terms of the biology of the of the insects that they don't like to be so much uh, close to each other. So. Uh, even in the real space, they approach each other, but uh, probably not, not not that much to see this kind of, of shocks. But in terms of biological terms, of course more difficult, but in terms of observation, we haven't observed this, this kind of phenomena in the experiments. So, mm -hmm. so this uh, you, you call the equation-free approach, and you have to formulate the main 
written and the individual country. Aren't those formulas as standard things? I mean, I, I used them in some papers of mine many years ago, so why do you call that a question-free approach and oh, well, you claim that that's something new? Or, or no, no, I don't call, uh, I don't call it a question-free. Uh, Jan is calling it a question-free. Uh, we, we haven't introduced this method. We, we just took the method. Yeah, but it's just yeah. related to Quebecese either. I mean, these are just standard uh, procedures. Yes, yeah, they are regarding a book, I know. Yeah, but uh, why is... Uh, well, the reading of the name, where, where comes this, uh, where does the reading of the name come from? I don't know. I, we just took the, we just took the method. He explored this method very much. And uh, we took, uh, we took this method from, from his paper. We, and we employed it. So I, I really don't know it. Janice, Janice for the kids' papers. But I'm saying that that existed before that. Yeah. Actually, what he calls uh, 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 this equation three approaches. Uh, something more general. I think in well, this case doesn't really make so much sense to go that way. Yeah, but that's probably true. I don't know. But as I said, we, we are having at nothing to methodology, uh, methodology, methodology in this sense, which has to be method. It might be, it might have a different origin. Yeah, at this, this I don't know. But there is no contribution at all in the, in this, in computational terms. Simple application to the, to the biological experiment. So I, I'm not sure about, uh, about, well, the, I know these formulas are very old. They, they can be found not just in paper, but in, in classic uh, books. Uh, so, I will briefly comment uh, a second problem now, which is, uh, Somehow inspired in the experiment, but uh, we do not claim that uh, modeling the experiment is more like uh, we take some inspiration from the experiment, from the experiment, to introduce a model which. Uh, have uh, interesting dynamics. And the problem is the following. We consider uh, particles running in a circle with a constant velocity and uh, they might uh, walk in both directions. One two of uh, these particles meet, they may interact. There is a rate of interaction which determines uh, when these particles interact or they just simply cause each other. If they interact, they uh, form a cluster of two particles <coughs> which moves either to the right or to the left. Uh, and uh, we continue this process forever in such a way that when there is an interaction of a cluster with n particles and a cluster with n particles, a single a single cluster with uh, n plus n particles is formed, and. Uh, it chooses the direction of motion randomly. This is one half probability going to the right and one half going to the left. Okay. Uh, to solve uh, this problem, we use a couple of assumptions. First one is. <coughs> that uh, the rate of interaction is small enough. So uh, clusters, they uh, go round several times before an interaction takes place. This, uh, this supports the well stood assumption for the system. So we can get rid of the spatial dependence. And uh, the second one is the 
uh, molecular uh, chaos uh, or a boson such as calcium, which allows to split the uh, which allow to split the dist which allows to split the distribution function uh, of two clusters in the product of two distributions of uh, of one uh, of one cluster. So this leads uh, to this Smolotowski equation. So the position of the, the cluster is the position of the center of mass, and the radius is they, they are uh, two clusters. But I mean they are punctual, but they are they, they are running one dimension. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this allows us to uh, write this uh, two, spe uh, two species Smolotowski equation. Uh, and this the kernel is the one I mentioned before. When two clusters meet, they have one uh, not just meet but interact. They have one half probability of going in one direction or the other. If one solves uh, this. This is an exactly integrable kernel, and if one solves this equation exactly, one finds that uh, for long times there are uh, a number of plastic or, uh, or, uh, a number of clusters all walking in the same direction, and uh, the direction which wins is the one in which there uh, were more clusters initially. It doesn't matter the number of particles actually. If if one starts with exactly the same number of clusters running in opposite directions, one finds that this uh, consensus, consensus is never reached uh, as long as we have uh, enough large uh, number of initial of initial mass. And in this case, one can show that uh, can show that the cluster distribution adopts a self uh, similar form for long times, which means that uh, consensus is never reached and clusters with a smaller number of particles are disappearing. And mass is towards is, is moving towards uh, clusters of a greater and greater size. And finally, uh, one would have for uh, in the infinite time, one would have all all mass at infinity. It's about for time. Oh, this is this is a very long time. But you you, you need mass enough, of course. Do <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you allow for a cluster to break down into pieces? No, no, no fragmentation. Just coagulation. So, of course, so if there is only coagulation, mm -hmm. the only possible final state is a single cluster. No, several. No, so because when they interact, they will meet together, then they, they move with the same velocity. Yeah, but they, they, they don't move in the same direction. Yeah. No, but they, but they change velocity, they change the same direction when they interact randomly. So, so... They move in the same direction. And this is what you find, that they have several clusters moving in the same direction. Except in the... Case where the initial conditions are exactly the same. When you find this uh, so similar phenomenon, mm -hmm. this, uh, you go uh, towards one cluster of infinite size. And yes, uh, the last uh, the last slide is considering uh, the same model with a different <coughs> direction kernel, <coughs> which is exactly integrable. In this case, the direction of motion <coughs> uh, is selected uh, with a greater probability, taking into account the majority of the direction of the uh, the majority of the particles traveling when the interaction uh, between clusters takes place. Uh, in this case, which apparently implies a, a stronger trend towards order, 
in this case, uh, consensus is never reached, independently of the initial condition. And the number of uh, particles, not clusters, but the number of particles uh, traveling in each direction try to be raised uh, for long times. And again, we have the same uh, self-similar phenomenon. But in this case, we, uh, we don't have an exact solution of, uh, for the profile for the scaling function. In the previous case, it was an exponential. In this case, uh, the profiles have to be found, uh, uh, has to be, have to be found numerically. But both, uh, both self-similar uh, asymptotics can be obtained actually rigorously. In this case, we need just uh, uh, should be computationally assisted for uh, completing the profile. And just, uh, I would like to thank my collaborators in this uh, in this case, uh, Fabrizio Mafia from the Technical University of Madrid and uh, Juan Velázquez, who is at the CCC, the same institute where I am. And I have the third story that I think I will give it for a different moment. <laughs> thank you for your attention. Yeah, uh, aligning uh, happens in the field. Uh, yeah, that's right. In actual uh, 2D, aligning in 3D for flying insects. Uh, but in this case, when well, the experiment was performed in this screen, yes, well, it's some, of course, I uh, idealized experimental situation. We wanted to map the situation uh, to 1D or quasi 1D. Uh, the lightning step is collecting uh, the actual results that we will get in this lab <coughs> to the to what is seen in the field, but alignment uh, in uh, it's also seen. Hmm? It's also seen in the field. Yeah, yeah, it it, it happens in the field. Okay, the same question. I don't know <coughs> the role of having. Okay, you pick the big set model that is something that has been at least designed for the as a model for the flyer birds. Mm -hmm. When you have alignment, mm -hmm. you use this model, and then you. This is an approximation. You use another approximation that, that is the mean field approximation of this model. Uh -huh. Then you use another approximation that is the equation free analysis uh -huh. because it's also an approximation of this. Uh -huh. And then you compare with the data. Uh, no, well, the, the mean field approximation is done uh, just to uh, check the equation free uh, in this particular case. But we, we don't use the equation free anymore. Then we use actual local interactions. For the rest, we use the actual local experimental data. Well, we analyze experimental data, but uh, for the yeah. released model, we use uh, local interaction, not what we feel. We feel was a checking of the. I mean, the this is something. I mean, you, you say, okay, now I will add a multiplicative match, right? Yeah. And this is something that you take from the model. There is a biological inspiration of this multiplicative noise, or you yeah. use the multiplicative noise, you see that the data are feeling better, and then you say, okay, the multiplicative way is saying that the locus is doing that. Yeah. Well, we, we analyze the actual data, and we find this, uh, this diffusion, and we propose a modification of the model, which, uh, in principle, uh, it's not, uh, we don't necessarily lead to this diffusion, but then you uh, do the same computational analysis and you find that indeed this uh, multiplicative noise in the model is reflected 
in this uh, average, uh, in the effective uh, Fokker-Planck equation for the average velocity. But they would take that biological minimum, right? But it would be possible from the experiments, if you follow the individual locus, you would be able mm -hmm. to see how, how the stochastic the statistics yes. is, no? Well, um, might be. So you would be able to, to justify your multiplicative noise term or not? Mm, yeah, we, we would try to uh, justify it during this uh, analysis, this uh, effective focal plan equation analysis of the model. This, is, this, this will be, I think this can be done, but not for 40 knots, because the, you try to model the, the motion of one locus is interaction with the others. Then you don't know if you should assign any motion to the noise path or to the interaction with the other path. But uh, what he does is only looking at the global velocity. Mm -hmm. Then the global velocity is only one global velocity, then anything which is not there is on the noise path. <coughs> it will not be easy to do for the individuals. Yes. Okay. There are no further questions. First time speaking again. <laughs> Maybe we get tomorrow on Friday.